I have a question. How many times does your heart beat in a minute? One way to answer that question would simply be to measure your pulse for an entire minute. But when you go to a doctor's office and a nurse takes your pulse, does that test last for an entire minute? It lasts for a much shorter time. How else could you determine how many heartbeats in a minute? You could measure for 30 seconds and then multiply by two. Or you can measure for 10 seconds and multiply by six. Or six seconds and multiply by 10. You could measure for one second and multiply by 60. And what you are already learning is that the larger sample with the longer time is going to be a much better point estimator for your full minute. 30 seconds is going to give you a better point estimation than 15 seconds, and certainly better than one second. So here's another question. How many times does your heart beat in an hour? How could you answer that without measuring your pulse for an entire hour? One way would be to use what we already know about sampling, which is measure for 60 seconds and then multiply that by 60. However, if we measure for 60 seconds one time, we're getting a very specific estimation. What might work better would be to measure 60 seconds now and then 10 minutes from now and then 20 minutes from now and do six total samples. And then what would you do? At the end of those six samples, you would average the numbers from each sample, and that would give you a good estimation of how many times your heart beats in an hour. Well, how then do you get a good sample? And the first thing that you need to know about a good sample is that when we collect a sample, we are not interested in the sample for the sake of the sample. We're interested in what that sample can tell us about the population from which it was drawn. And a good sample can tell us a lot about its population. A good sample is representative of the population, meaning that the qualities of the sample are so similar to the qualities of the population that what we learn from the sample readily applies to the population from which it was drawn. When we do research, our research question involves the entire population. We want to know about everyone. However, it would cost a lot of money and take a lot of time to measure everyone in the population. So instead, what we do is take a sample, measure that sample, and then take what we learn from that sample and apply it to the population. If the sample is representative, then the characteristics of the sample would apply in general to the population. The word that we use to describe that in general application is to generalize. It means that the sample is not going to be precisely like the population, but it's going to be close enough that what we learn from the sample applies, generalizes to that population. However, if our sample is not representative, then what we learn from our sample is not very telling of the population. And we would say that we have some sampling error that explains that difference. We want to estimate the characteristics of the population based on what we have learned from our sample. Let's review some definitions that we are going to need as we talk about sampling and sampling methodology. The first is population, the entire collection of units that the researcher studies. A unit is an element of the population, also known as a subject or a participant. Your sample is a subset of units that have been drawn from the population. Subjects are participants in the sample, also known as units. And the frame is a list of all of the elements in the population that may be sampled. Here's some other definitions. A representative sample has similar characteristics as the population. Therefore, what we learn 
from that sample will apply in general. It will generalize, which is to apply the results from the sample to the population. And sampling error occurs when samples are not random or representative. Therefore, how can we get a representative sample? And the answer is, you can't. However, we can use good sampling methodology to get a random sample. Because the best way to get a representative sample is to use a random sample. Using random sampling does not guarantee that your sample will be representative, but it is the best way to get close. And we know that when we are not doing random sampling, the chances of sampling error increase dramatically. A random sample is where every member of the population has an equal chance of being selected. That doesn't mean that everyone will be selected, but their chances of being selected are equal. What could happen if our sample was not representative? Let me tell you a story that I believe should be in every introductory statistics course. It's a story about the 1936 Literary Digest Presidential Survey. In 1936, Literary Digest magazine ma mailed 10 million postcards asking people their choice for president. Of the 2 million responses that they received, 57% preferred the Republican Alf Landon. However, do you recall President Alf Landon? Landon lost by a wide margin to Democrat Franklin D. Roosevelt. So what went wrong with this survey? Was it that they only got 2 million responses out of 10 million? It turns out that 2 million out of 10 million is an excellent response rate. Many times when we mail out surveys, if we get a 2 or 3 or a 5% response rate, we feel like we've done something remarkable. So a 20% response rate is actually quite good. Was the problem that they mailed all of their postcards only to their own readers? That was not the problem either. They mailed out those postcards much more widely. So what else could explain why this survey result was so wrong? And the answer has to do with where the Literary Digest got the names, addresses, or phone numbers that they used to select people who would receive a postcard. The answer is that these names were selected from phone books and automobile registration lists. Now think about 1936. What was going on in the American economy in 1936? We were in the Great Depression. Who had their own phone? Who had their own vehicle that could be registered? People who had more money. And those people were more likely to support the Republican candidate. Therefore, we have sampling error, asking too many of the same people and getting a skewed result in the sample. In the future, I'm going to tell you about a more recent presidential election and how sampling error skewed the polling in that election as well. But for now, I want to summarize what we know about samples and their populations. For this example, I want you to imagine that we are cooking a pot of stew and we think that the stew is almost ready to serve. But we want to know for sure and so we need to taste the elements of this stew. Our kettle of stew is the population about which we want to know something. But how large a sample do we need to know whether this kettle has been properly seasoned, whether the potatoes are fully cooked, whether it needs more time on the stove. Do we have to eat an entire bowl of stew in order to make that judgment? No. How much do we really need? We could tell something about that stew with a single spoonful. However, what has to be true about that spoonful for it to tell us something useful about our population? The spoonful must be representative. In other words, every element in the stew is represented in that spoonful. We have the carrots and the potatoes and every other ingredient that is in the stew. If you're missing the onions in your spoonful, 
you won't learn anything about whether those onions need to cook longer. Therefore, only a representative sample can tell us something useful about the entire population. Let's apply our cooking analogy to sampling. Results from a sample, the spoonful, should generalize to the population. What is true of the spoonful should also be true of the kettle. A sample, spoonful, generalizes better when it is more representative, when each element from the population is represented in the spoonful. And the best way to get a representative sample, a spoonful that tells us about the kettle, is to use a random sample. And how would we get a random sample of stew? We would start by stirring up the kettle so that all of the ingredients are randomly distributed. And then we reach in with that spoon and scoop up what we get. That would be a random sample. Or we may want to be more deliberate, making sure that we get at least one of every element in the kettle. And that would have to do with our sampling methodology. All ideas that we'll be discussing in the course of this set of lectures. So for now, let's start looking at how we can sample various populations.